Good evening, everybody, and welcome back, friends. Tom Snyder with you here on the Wednesday Night Radio Show for October 9, 1991, out of ABC in Los Angeles, California. And tonight we hearken back to the golden age of big-time network radio and the Amos and Andy program on the air on Tuesday nights. Joining me tonight is Melvin Ely, professor of Afro-American and Southern history at Yale University and the author of a wonderful new book called The Adventures of Amos and Andy, A Social History of an American Phenomenon. For years, the phrase Amos and Andy has been used as a glib synonym for racial stereotyping, but for millions of people, beginning back in the 1930s, Amos and Andy meant 15 minutes of entertainment every night. The adventures of two black men who were played by two white men, two actors, Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll. This program entranced the nation. As a matter of fact, when Amos and Andy came on the radio at 7 o'clock at night in some parts of the country, they interrupted the movies and theaters for 15 minutes so people could listen to them on the speakers. The power of radio, the life and times of Amos and Andy on the radio show for Wednesday night. Now, I realize that there are many people in this audience as we attract younger people more and more to these programs. Uh, who do not understand or don't remember or don't know who Amos and Andy were. These were two black men in the 1930s, played by two white men. I mentioned the actors, uh, Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll. These were two black men, at the time American Negroes, who migrated from someplace in the South to Chicago to run something called the Fresh Air Taxi Company. Their, their, their foibles and their situations were, in many cases, hysterical. It was some of the great comedy ever produced in radio, but as we'll learn tonight from Elvin Ely, it was a two-edged sword. Uh, before we get to this conversation, I want to play for you just a couple of minutes here of one of the original Amos and Andy programs. Uh, this one is entitled Amos and Andy Go to New York. The actors are Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll. Uh, I have the exact date here somewhere, but not in front of me, but this would be back from sometime in the 1930s or early 1940s. Here is just about two and a half minutes of the adventures of Amos and Andy. Yes, and it seems to me like it was only yesterday I was introducing Amos and Andy. Only yesterday when the boys first came to New York from the South. I remember they took a furnished room up on 134th Street. And the first day Amos came home, he found Andy doing a little figuring. Seven million, eight million, <laughs> ten million. His eye blue, mm. his eye blue, tell everybody. Say, Andy, what are you figuring over there, son? Well, Amos, now that we is in New York, I'm going into broker business. I figure uh, on the money I gonna make you. I'm counting on being another J. Ping Pong Morgan. <laughs> well, I think Wall Street, Andy, is a little too high for us, son. But I tell you what, we ought to uh, get some kind of job. Yeah, that's right. We don't want to keep on nibbling on our savings here. You know, I got the evening paper here. I think we could look into help on it, as Andy, and see what they got in there. Yeah, give me that thing. Let me see here. Uh, look at this news item here. It say we is exporting cheese to France and all the Frenchmen is happy about it. Uh, where do it say that, Andy? Right here in this headline. Look at there. Thousands cheer as Limburger arrives in Paris. <laughs> oh, no, Andy, that's Lindbergh. Oh, oh. Uh, the one that is inside the paper, Andy, toward the back there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, here we is, here we is. Yeah, say, uh, look at that, Andy. There sure is a lot of ads for taxi cab drivers. Yeah, you think we could get a job driving a cab, huh? No, we got $400 saved, Andy, and I was just thinking, you know, maybe me and you could get a cab of our own. Buy a cab, Amos, check and double check. <laughs> Okay, let me just correct something here. While these programs were produced originally in the 30s and 40s, the material that we have tonight is from their 10,000th show on CBS on November 16 of 1952, in which Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll recreated some of their favorite vignettes. So the voices you hear are Amos and Andy, but the, what they're doing is recreations of original programming, and the announcer is Bill Hay. We'll be joined by Melvin Ely to talk about his book, The Adventures of Amos and Andy, 
the social history of an American phenomenon right after these messages. Okay, identify this. Yep, it's a dying refrigerator. Gave its life for cold cuts. Fortunately, if you weren't emotionally attached, Sears Brand Central can replace it. Until Saturday, there's a Kenmore 18 cubic foot top mount for $419 even. Save 30 bucks. All frostless, too. Believe me, that's a real good price for a Kenmore. But it's just till Saturday at Sears Brand Central. The brand you want at the store you trust. Prices may vary in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. It's the Sears Home Sale, when you can get beautiful home furnishings at some of the lowest prices of the year. Like big, thirsty, 100% cotton bath towels for an unbelievably low $2.99 while quantities last. The lowest price around for a towel of this size and weight. And Sears has mattresses starting as low as $69.88 for the twin size, plus all the best names like Sealy and Spring Air. Get to Sears Home Sale while the selection is up and the prices are down. But hurry, the sale ends October 26th. Are you an inventor? Or do you know an inventor who would like to have an invention or idea submitted to industry? For free information on how to proceed, phone 1-800-727-IDEA. Invention Submission Corporation, one of America's largest invention service organizations, has an inventor's kit you can have free. It contains a form for recording your invention's date of origination, plus an informative brochure and other material of interest to new inventors. Get your free kit by dialing 1-800-727-IDEA, IDEA. That's 727, IDEA. Even if you only have an idea for improving an existing product and don't know where to go with it, you will want this free inventor's kit. It shows you how your invention may be packaged and submitted to industry through a data bank and by various other means. It's a free call, so dial 1-800-727-IDEA. That's 727-IDEA. We are back and joined by Melvin Ely, who is the author of The Adventures of Amos and Andy, A Social History of an American Phenomenon. Uh, Mr. Ely is a professor of Afro-American and Southern History at Yale University and joins us tonight from Brantford, Connecticut. Melvin, thank you for coming on and welcome to our program, sir. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. I want to ask you a question here that dawned on me as this tape was playing of the recreation. The material is humorous. There's no question about that. But am I doing any kind of uh, any any kind of a disservice here by bringing back these programs in your view? Well, I really don't think so, uh, because uh, clearly uh, I think this is an interesting enough story to be worth a book, and uh, it's it's part of our history. Uh, there are many parts of our history that we think twice about now and ask ourselves certain questions about. And one of the questions about Amos and Andy is how this show, in which, as you say, a couple of white men portrayed a couple of black men or a group of black men over the years, what, uh, what does it tell us about the way we Americans were thinking about race, the way blacks and whites were thinking about each other over a long period of years? So right. I don't think it's a disservice at all. I think it's, uh, it's food for thought. Let me ask you the obvious question here, and that is intent. What was the intent of the writers, the producers, and the two actors, uh, Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll, when they put this program on the air? Well, the first... I mean, was it, uh, forgive me, was it to entertain America, or was it to say something about the Negro American? Well, the first thing that's worth noting is that when the show started out, and for a good number of years, the producers, writers, and actors were all the same two men, Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell. So uh, it, this was the day when, before radio became uh, the industry that it later became. Mm -hmm. And what they were trying to do was to entertain people. They didn't have any overt idea of making uh, statements about race. These were two guys who had grown up in an America where uh, the, the minstrel show uh, depiction of, of blacks and the vaudeville blackface act were uh, part of the meat and potatoes of show business. Uh, they had uh, played minstrel roles themselves. They had directed amateur minstrel shows uh, for years. And they decided to do a show about two black characters precisely because black characters is what they'd been seeing, what they'd been doing for years. It seemed like a natural thing to do. But right. the goal of this program was to, uh, to create something that radio had not seen before, but which would fulfill radio's great potential. And that is to, to tell a story in a humorous way that would make Americans want to tune in and listen. 
So they came from the discipline of blackface, the minstrel shows, and they married it to a, to a fledgling embryonic radio network at the time. That's right. Uh, this uh, Amos and Andy show is uh, a landmark of radio history, not only because it was the first uh, real radio serial comedy, but it was, in a way, the first radio melodrama or soap opera, too, because, as you mentioned, this show, for the first decade or, or decade and a half it was on, came on every night for 15 minutes, and it told not just a bunch of jokes, but a continuing story of characters mm -hmm. going through all sorts of misadventures in the northern city. And uh, although Gosden and Carell weren't trying to make uh, profound commentary about race in America, they, um, I guess they had a pretty good set of uh, social antennae because they decided to make their characters do exactly what hundreds of thousands of real black Americans were doing. The, the breaking story in American race relations in the 1920s and 30s was this mass migration of rural southern blacks to the northern city. And it's precisely that setting that these guys decided to make their uh, uh, the, the nucleus of their show. Now, when you get to the bit of comedy that we heard in the recreation where the one says to the other, we're exporting Limburger cheese to Paris, and then the other says, no, that's not Limburger, that's Charles Lindbergh, and we hear the laughter of the audience watching that show. <sighs> Now, that would be seen as a put-down of African Americans. At the time it was broadcast, and in the context of the social times in which people heard it, was that just comedy, or was it saying something about the way white America perceived black America used the language, and, underst and, and understood in this case, in the case of Charles Lindbergh, a major story in the news? Uh, it's really both of those things, because that, that very same joke could have been performed by white actors playing white characters. Uh, the joke would have been the same. It still would have gotten a laugh. Uh, just the same way that Archie Bunker on All in the Family used to speak in malapropisms and get words wrong. Mm -hmm. and everyone laughed at that. But on the other hand, uh, uh, white Americans uh, in, in those days saw basically only a very few kinds of characterizations of, of blacks in entertainment, and they were all... Well, the, the depictions were often affectionate, but they were also patronizing. I mean, there was no other show that you could uh, flip on and hear uh, a black uh, a superhero or uh, a, a, a normal black family uh, making their way through life. The only depiction of blacks that, that you had access to in those days was either the, the Afro-American as musician, uh, people like Duke Ellington did appear on the radio, or uh, the black man as a comic figure. So when audiences listened to this show, uh, they weren't struck by the fact that black people were, were being in, in some way demeaned, uh, but, but blacks were in fact being to some degree demeaned. It was just part of the scenery of America back then. It's something that everybody was unfortunately used to. And if we go ahead in radio history to the time of the great Jack Benny programs, we see the emergence of another black, Eddie Rochester Anderson, but he too is pictured in a subservient role. He is the houseman, the manservant, the janitor, if you will, of the Jack Benny household and lifestyle. Yes, but you know, Rochester's interesting. There's a, a, a historian named Joseph Boskin who's written about this, I think, pretty astutely, uh, and it points out, as the producer of the Jack Benny show once pointed out to me, that the joke uh, about Rochester is that Rochester was really, in a way, Jack Benny's boss. He was constantly giving Jack Benny lip. He was constantly refusing to do what Jack Benny wanted him to do. So it was really kind of a new twist on the subservient role where the, the servant gets in his licks, too. So in that way, it was kind of a departure from what had been shown before. I have to pause here for the radio stations. We're talking tonight with Melvin Ely, whose book is called The Adventures of Amos and Andy, A Social History of an American Phenomenon. We'll be right back with Mr. Ely and eventually some of you on the toll-free line right after these messages. Do you know there are only 44 sounds in the English language? 44! And when you learn these 44 sounds called phonics, you can read and spell almost everything. That's why Hooked on Phonics is so successful. We've set these 44 sounds to music, making learning to read simple and fun. So get Hooked on Phonics and take the mystery out of learning to read. Call 1-800-ABCDEFG. 
Hey, I'm a nice person. I deserve it. Sears semi-annual fine jewelry sale. Here I come. Gold, gemstones, pearls, watches, even diamonds are on sale now. 25 to 65 percent below comparable values elsewhere. And if I spend at least $100 on my Sears charge, I get zero percent financing. I pay nothing till next year. Sears semi-annual fine jewelry sale is over on the 20th, so I better hurry. If you're a nice person and love a great sale, maybe you better hurry too. Are you an inventor? Or do you know an inventor who would like to have an invention or idea submitted to industry? For free information on how to proceed, phone 1-800-727-IDEA. Invention Submission Corporation, one of America's largest invention service organizations, has an inventor's kit you can have free. It contains a form for recording your invention's date of origination, plus an informative brochure and other material of interest to new inventors. Get your free kit by dialing 1-800-727-IDEA, IDEA. That's 727-IDEA. Even if you only have an idea for improving an existing product and don't know where to go with it, you will want this free inventor's kit. It shows you how your invention may be packaged and submitted to industry through a data bank and by various other means. It's a free call, so dial 1-800-727-IDEA. That's 727-IDEA. Okay, identify this. Yep, it's a dying refrigerator. Gave its life for cold cuts. Fortunately, if you weren't emotionally attached, Sears Brand Central can replace it. Until Saturday, there's a Kenmore 18 cubic foot top mount for $419 even. Save 30 bucks. All frostless, too. Believe me, that's a real good price for a Kenmore. But it's just till Saturday at Sears Brand Central. The brand you want at the store you trust. Prices may vary in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Don't like the weather? Do something about it. No, continuing right through the morning rush, we'll have complete closings coming right up. Do something about the weather. Turn on WICC 60. Year after year, more schools and businesses tell their students and employees to turn on WICC for up-to-the-minute information on closings and delays. If there's a storm brewing, stock up on food. Get extra batteries for your flashlight, find the candles and matches, and turn to us. Service 60 WICC. You're listening to Service 60 WICC. As this show is on the air, what is, what is white America's perception of what's happening to Amos and Andy? Are these just a couple of happy darkies running a taxi cab company, uh, going through life, enjoying everything as, as it happens? Well, the in, in the mind of white America at the time. The thing that fascinated me about Amos and Andy and what makes it a real story is that unlike other uh, shows and acts that depicted blacks, Amos and Andy was pretty complex. It had the uh, this sort of puns and malapropisms, and it had the comical stereotypes of, of blacks, but it also told a story that people, both black and white, found engrossing. It, it included characters, usually incidental ones, but uh, fairly frequently characters who were black, but who were also depicted as educated, accomplished people who practiced professions and so forth. And this was the only place in uh, American entertainment that, uh, that one saw those kinds of depictions. So Amos and Andy had so many different levels to it that what a given American heard it depended on what his or her preconceptions were. So I ended up being able to use Amos and Andy as kind of an inkblot test for uh, American racial attitudes because uh, you could see the, the, the views of the ultra-racist come out in some of the fan mail that people would, would write uh, in which they used the most derogatory language about the characters they were listening to. And yet at the other end of the spectrum, you would find uh, white uh, crusaders for racial justice like Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's wife, or uh, in fact black Americans like Roy Wilkins, who later became head of the NAACP, praising the program and saying that what was so great about it was that it captured universal human uh, emotions, pathos and uh, joy, and that it really wasn't a race-bound or race-specific at all. So. Uh, I was. I really found that I could learn a lot about the racial landscape of America by looking at how people reacted to this show. Now, you mentioned that Roy Wilkins, who later, as you say, became president of the NAACP, uh, saw some positives in Amos and Andy. Yet, wasn't it the NAACP some years later that was instrumental in taking the television program off the air? 
Well, that's that's true, and not only is that true, but Roy Wilkins had switched uh, sides by then. In 1930, Roy Wilkins was a journalist and wrote uh, a couple of newspaper columns uh, about how not just that Amos and Andy had its good sides, but that it was it was really a wonderful show that uh, that depicted its characters in a sympathetic way that it didn't demean its characters, that it conveyed the whole range of human emotions mm -hmm. that are shared by everyone, white and black. By 1951, Roy Wilkins was part of the NAACP leadership, and he did join, uh, help lead a campaign by the NAACP to knock the show off of television. By then, many radio shows had moved to TV. Amos and Andy moved to television, and, of course, a cast of black actors were were hired at that point. Including the legendary Tim Moore, who played the part of the Kingfish, I believe. He was yeah. a remarkable performer. Yes, well, they were all remarkable performers. Tim Moore, uh, who played the Kingfish, had been in show business for something like 50 years. The, the fellow who played Andy, Spencer Williams Jr., had been a writer, producer, and director of, uh, of all black films. Alvin Childress, who played Amos, was uh, a classically trained stage actor who had had several notable successes and stage director so these were talented people and the irony is that once the show uh, is taken over by a cast of uh, of exceptional black actors this is the point uh, when a whole new protest arises which didn't knock the show off the air immediately it did stay on in prime time for two years and in syndication for about a dozen years after that but uh, it was an effective enough protest that it was a good long time before a television network considered uh, putting on another all-black situation comedy. And were you able to interview any of the members of the television cast? I should know that, and I don't even know if that was a purpose in your book, but did you talk to any of them? I, I just am curious as to what their feelings might have been at the cancellation of that program and the loss of, in some cases, possibly the role of a lifetime for a television sitcom. That's right. Well, well, Tim Moore, the Kingfish, and uh, Spencer Williams, Andy, uh, had been dead for years before I came to this, but uh, Alvin Childress, who played Amos, uh, though now deceased, was still alive. And I talked to him for many hours and also to some of the, the incidental actors in the show. And their feeling, really, they had two basic feelings. Let me ask you, my friend, to hold it for a couple sure. of minutes here. I've got a station break coming. And by the way, I want to play one more clip here because I don't think we should miss the fun that's part of the Amos and Andy story as well as the, as well as the social ramifications. So I'll be back with uh, Professor Melvin Ely, whose book is called The Adventures of Amos and Andy. Eventually, we'll be joined by some of you on the toll-free line here on the Wednesday night radio show. And after this station break, we'll be coming right back. You're on the radio show, and I'm Tom Snyder on Service 60 WICC. Hi, Jack Frost here. You know, before I get too busy with a hard freeze, I wanted to make sure you get to Sears Brand Central. Because right now, the AT&T Answering System Telephone 1504 is on sale at Sears' lowest price ever. Just $79.99, save $20 through October 12th. It's got a built-in phone, and you can get your messages from any touchtone phone. Just $79.99 at Sears Brand Central, the brand you want at the store you trust. Boy, I'd love one, and I could just call you guys. I mean, once you get to know me, Jack Frost, I'm a pretty cool guy. <laughs> Hey, I'm a nice person. I deserve it. Sears semi-annual fine jewelry sale, here I come. Gold, gemstones, pearls, watches, even diamonds are on sale now. 25 to 65 percent below comparable values elsewhere. And if I spend at least $100 on my Sears charge, I get zero percent financing. I pay nothing till next year. Sears semi-annual fine jewelry sale is over on the 20th, so I better hurry. If you're a nice person and love a great sale, maybe you better hurry too. Are you an inventor, or do you know an inventor who would like to have an invention or idea submitted to industry? For free information on how to proceed, phone 1-800-727-IDEA. Invention Submission Corporation, one of America's largest invention service organizations, has an inventor's kit you can have free. It contains a form for recording your invention's date of origination, plus an informative brochure and other material of interest to new inventors. Get your free kit by dialing one 800 then 727-IDEA, IDEA. That's 727, IDEA. Even if you only have an idea for improving an existing product and don't know where to go with it, you will want this free inventor's kit. It shows you how your invention may be packaged and submitted to industry through a data bank and by various other means. 
is a free call. So dial 1-800-727-IDEA. That's 727-IDEA. Okay. Now that the state income tax is in place and that Hartford anti-income tax rally is behind us, it's time to talk to the governor about where we go from here. This is WICC News Director Tim Quinn, and you can get your chance to speak with Governor Lowell Weicker about taxes, crime, education, layoffs, the economy, anything else. WICC's Ask the Governor program returns this Thursday evening, October 10th, 7 p.m. Your chance to Ask the Governor, where? Right here on Service 60, WICC. Your number one radio station where we give you those winning numbers, the daily 608, the play 4, 6029, and the service 60 forecast for the overnight clear to partly cloudy skies, lows in the 50s for tomorrow. Sunshine, that'll give way to clouds later in the day, a mild Thursday, highs about 70 degrees for Thursday night, some clouds rolling in, maybe a shower, lows to 50. And the outlook for Friday, clearing showers in the morning and partly sunny and seasonable in the afternoon. Currently, it's 59 degrees at your weather station. Service 60 WICC. We are back with Melvin Ely, the author of The Adventures of Amos and Andy, and I interrupted you in the middle of a point, sir. Go ahead. Well, uh, I was just going to say that uh, that Alvin Childress and the other actors I talked to from the television, Amos and Andy, felt that they had played their roles with dignity and integrity. And anybody who has seen, for example, the famous uh, Christmas episode of Amos and Andy, which, by the way, is widely available in video stores on cassette, in which uh, Amos, uh, at the end, explains the meaning of the Lord's Prayer to his daughter, will understand why... Alvin Childress was proud of that role for the rest of his life. Uh, he and the others also, I think deep down, could understand some of the NAACP's point, but they also felt that the New York uh, National Office of the NAACP were a bunch of outsiders who just didn't grasp that, uh, that there wasn't a lot of choice uh, available to, uh, to black actors in Hollywood, and that in fact the black actors saw Amos and Andy as, as a big step up for themselves. They saw the NAACP as interlopers who were sort of, uh, who were knocking them out of the opportunity of a lifetime, as you said. Well, because Amos and Andy, for many of the actors that we've talked about here, could have been a stepping stone to other television productions, more in the mainstream. Yeah, it could have been. Uh, the, uh, the problem, I think, was the fact that this was a new medium television, mm -hmm. and uh, that the medium came along in the wake of, of World War II, which after all was a war in which America had fought a battle of bullets and of propaganda against racist dictatorships abroad. White Americans had made a, an implied promise to black Americans to improve things here at home. Uh, African Americans saw progress being made. They were pushing harder and harder for progress in the late 40s and early 50s they saw a brand new medium of television which was supposed to be a clean slate. All the old stereotypes could be left behind and it would be a new day in which all kinds of depictions of black Americans would be seen on the screen. And then the NAACP looked up in 1951 and there was exactly one all black show on the air and it was good old, or to them not so good old Amos and Andy, inherited from a generation before, and that was just a case of dashed expectations that couldn't help but yield a protest. To go back to the radio show for a second, did the, did the audience know by and large that the two characters, Amos and Andy, were being played by white actors? You know, it took a great many Americans a long time to figure that out, and I'm talking about blacks as well as whites, because uh, Gosden and Carell were pretty sharp guys, and they were... Um, fans of some of the black uh, comic teams of the time and in fact not only imitated them but even lifted uh, some material from from black acts so to many people they sounded quite authentic i mean they were doing stuff that black acts were also doing and uh, many americans for the longest time thought that the actors were actually black and in fact on another radio show i did uh, an 88 year old black gentleman called in and said that until that very day despite decades of listening to Amos and Andy, <laughs> till that day he had not known that the actors were white. No kidding. No kidding. And what about the black acts that you mentioned that, that uh, Gosden and Carell knew and admired? 
Was there any resentment in the black acting community that two white guys were playing these roles? Yeah, there was resentment of that. Uh, the the uh, most famous black team at the time was a team called Miller and Lyle. And uh, Flournoy Miller, who was part of that team, w was, was quite resentful because uh, Gaston and Carell, in fact, had taken material straight out of his uh, and, and uh, Lyle's act. And in fact, Miller uh, threatened to take Carell and Gaston to court, accusing them not of slandering the black race, but of stealing, of stealing their material, his own way of depicting the black yeah, race. Yeah. Later, but Gaston and Carell were so uh, such a, a juggernaut; they were so powerful and, and successful that in the end, Flournoy Miller actually became a consultant of theirs and helped write scripts for the radio Amos and Andy, and helped find the actors who took over the roles for television. It was he who found the actors who played uh, Kingfish and Andy. Anyway, I want to play one more cut, uh, Melvin, because, as I say, I don't want us to miss the fun of what was Amos and Andy on the radio, and then I want to involve the listeners by phone. So I'm going to open the toll-free lines to all of you here at 800-248-0852. For the new listeners, again, I'll say it slowly because I have a habit of rushing it because I feel you all know it. It's 800-248-0852. Here is um, a two-minute and 40-second bite of Amos and Andy. This is called Love Comes to Amos and Andy. Well, despite the depression, the boys didn't do too bad with their fresh air taxi cab. Then, one Sunday after church services, love came to Amos Jones. The minister is standing at the front door of the church talking to a young girl as Amos approaches. Uh, excuse me, sir. I, I just want to tell you how much I enjoyed the services today. They, they sort of hit home with me, especially that part about the golden rule. Well, thank you, Amos. Do you two know each other? Amos Jones, this is Miss Taylor. Uh, Miss Taylor? Yes, uh, Ruby Taylor. Yeah, how you do? I'm glad to know you. Thank you. Same to you. Well, I hope you'll be here next Sunday. Yes, yeah, sir, I'll be here. Thank you, sir, and goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, is you going down this way? Yes. Uh, mind if I walk with you, Miss Taylor, uh, uh, Ruby? Not at all, Mr. Jones. Uh, Amos. <laughs> and it was just about that time that love came to Andy Brown, but in somewhat different surroundings. <laughs> You is about the sweetest, prettiest, gentlest flower that I has ever had the pleasure of running into. No, big boy, would you mind sitting still while I didn't use this manicure? Yeah. yeah, but you know something? You is the cutest hunk of female gender I done eyeballed in a long time. And you're just wasting your time. I's a widow and I knows all about men. When it comes to love, it's going to take a real... <laughs> oh, razzmatazz. <laughs> you know, my name is Andrew H. Brown. What's yours, honey? You can just call me Madam Queen. <laughs> Back with all of you on the toll-free exchange, we're talking with Melvin Ely, whose book, The Adventures of Amos and Andy, A Social History of an American Phenomenon, now a station break. Are you an inventor? Or do you know an inventor who would like to have an invention or idea submitted to industry? For free information on how to proceed, phone 1-800-727-IDEA. Invention Submission Corporation, one of America's largest invention service organizations, has an inventor's kit you can have free. It contains a form for recording your invention's date of origination, plus an informative brochure and other material of interest to new inventors. Get your... IDEA, IDEA. That's 727, IDEA. Even if you only have an idea for improving an existing product and don't know where to go with it, you will want this free inventor's kit. It shows you how your invention may be packaged and submitted to industry through a data bank and by various other means. It's a free call. So dial 1-800-727-IDEA. That's 727-IDEA. 
Tell me, sir, uh -huh. how do you think Buick improved the all-new LeSabre for 1992? Well, that's a tough act to follow, but they probably made it better. Better? Yeah, I mean, why would they have changed Buick's best-selling car at all if it weren't to make it better? Exactly. Uh -huh. New LeSabre styling isn't just more beautiful, it's more aerodynamic. Which means it's better. There's more horsepower from its improved 3800 V6. Better. And a larger trunk with a low liftover design to make loading and unloading easier. That's better on your bag, isn't Le it? LeSabre's new interior is easier even roomier. I knew that. And with a standard driver's side airbag mm -hmm. and available anti-lock brakes, mm -hmm. it's safer, too. Better yet, huh? And you know, even with all these changes, you still get that same great Buick quality that goes hand-in-hand -hand with the name LeSabre. So, basically, what you're trying to tell me is that this new LeSabre is... Better. Aha. So test drive the all-new 1992 LeSabre at your local Buick dealer. I'll do that. The new symbol for quality in America. And what could be better than that? Now, honestly, somewhere between the evening news and your favorite reruns, you've got some spare time, right? Well, if you'll spend some of that time with a National Dynamics language program, we'll have you speaking and understanding Spanish, French, Italian, German, or Japanese in 30 days. No books, no classes. Just our audio tapes in your home car or portable cassette player. Call this number today, 1-800-545-1985. That's 1-800-545-1985. Now, really, how many reruns can you watch? Chocolate chip cookies. Well, I promised, didn't I? But what about your arthritis? I found something that's good for my arthritis. And that's Arthricare, the only rub that's warming yet odor-free. Arthricare relieves minor arthritis pain for hours. Use only as directed. I love you, Grandma. I love you too, sweetheart. And I love your chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> warming yet odor-free Arthricare, because people are counting on you. Okay, we're back talking with Melvin Ely of uh, Yale University about Amos and Andy on the radio, and we start the parade with Jess in Santa Rosa, California. Hello. Hello. Good evening, sir. Buzz me, Miss Blue. Buzz me. Do you remember those? N no, I don't. Maybe uh, maybe Melvin well, does. Any time he'd want his secretary, he'd always say, buzz me, Miss Blue. <laughs> and they used to have a term, uh, one of them would say, oh... And the other one would say, what do you mean by O? And he'd say, just plain old-fashioned O. <laughs> and that, that became quite a habit of theirs. But the one I always remember that I got the biggest kick out of was they hit upon the word of bigamy. And they was wanting to know what bigamy was. And one of them said, that's a man's got two wives. Oh, well, he says, what if he has three wives? Well, I guess they call it trigamy. Well, what if you got just one wife? Well, that's called monotony. <laughs> but I, that's some of the things that I remember, and I thought it was a great play, the check and double check, you know, all the way through. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Eugene in New York City, hello. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I'd like to point out that the uh, humor of Amos and Andy, they, they mentioned about it, demeaning b the blacks, but um, I think it, their humor was in the tradition of the, the great uh, comedians like Laurel and Hardy and Abbott and Costello and Lum and Abner. And uh, speaking about Lum and Abner... Um, well, we're really talking about Amos and Andy tonight, so I really don't want to go too far down the Lum and Abner road. I'd like to point out that the, 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 their old 15-minute program uh, was um, was not the same as the half hour show. It, it didn't have an audience, and it had this the warm quality that Lemon, a show like Lum and Abner had. Hello. Any, yeah. Any comment on that, Melvin? Yeah, uh, the show did change uh, fairly drastically during World War II. Before then, it had been a nightly 15-minute show. Uh, there wasn't a live audience. There was an announcer, but he really had very little to say at the beginning of the show. There was very little in the way of sound effects, really almost nothing at first. And it's almost unfathomable to us in this media-drenched age that most of America came to a stop every night to hear a show that consisted not of nothing at all except two men talking. Now, they might play more than two roles. They might play three or four or five. Mm -hmm. But there was no music, no razzmatazz, nothing. There was a magnetism there that, uh, that, that I don't think was ever recaptured when the show switched to the weekly half-hour sitcom format that we were hearing in the clips. I'm, I'm not a good historian on these points, but I think the only other program that so affected an audience in terms of theaters postponing the starting times of plays and movies 
Restaurants closing down for an hour was the advent of the Texaco Star Theater with Milton Berle on television. Yeah, that's probably the, the, the closest uh, that, that we've come to this set. And I, I'd like to note, too, that last clip that you played, you really couldn't have picked a better one to, to show the, the, the various levels of Amos and Andy, because here you have Madam Queen and Andy as uh, sort of standard issue uh, uh, comic uh, stereotypes of blacks. You have Amos speaking in a stage dialect that identifies him as black, but he's he's reserved and dignified. And then if you've noticed, you have the black preacher and Ruby Taylor, uh, utterly dignified, polished people speaking, uh, speaking the English of, uh, of people with college degrees. And mm -hmm. Amos and Andy from the outset had all of these elements all in one show. All right, here's George in uh, Dallas. Hello. Uh, Tom? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, uh, those were the good old days, and uh, I, I sure. Whatever happened to uh, imitation being the highest form of flattery? I didn't know there were two white folks that were doing that either, but I'd like to ask you. Uh, you, you mean you didn't know till now? Oh, yeah, oh, I knew after that. But oh. I mean, when I, you know, I used to listen to it when I was a kid. Right. Gosh, I didn't know. But, you know, in the... In the uh, context of uh, how blacks were represented on radio, I wonder if Melvin's familiar with another show, Beulah. Uh, oh, Hattie right. Daniel? Yeah, Hattie, yeah, right. right. Yeah, uh, now she was the peacemaker. She was the uh, person who, who kept the house in order. And uh, what do you have to say about that as far as contrasting? Because uh, I thought Amos and Andy was super. Well, uh, Beulah was like Amos and Andy in the sense that here, too, the part of Beulah was played not only by a white person, but did you know uh, she was played by a white man? I didn't know. I thought it was Hattie McDaniel. Well, eventually, eventually Hattie McDaniel took over the role, and like Amos and Andy, Beulah went to television. Uh -huh. uh, but I believe the character of Beulah originated on the Great Gildersleeve and was played by a man, a white man named Marlon Hurt. That is correct. And uh, the other thing that's interesting about Beulah is that she was sort of the classical uh, black mammy figure. There, there had uh, long in entertainment and popular literature been one black character, uh, one black type who was a Allowed to, if you want, give a lip to white people and give advice to, to white people. Uh -huh. As you say, the peacemaker, and that character was was the mammy. And uh, we saw her in Gone with the Wind, and we saw her on uh, on Beulah, and sometimes we still see her today. Mm -hmm. George, thanks for joining thank us. You. All right, thank you, sir. Bye bye, Margaret in High Point, North Carolina. Hello. Hello, Professor. Um, I really have enjoyed listening to these tapes tonight. They really did have brought back memories, and I love Amos and Andy. I do have a problem with uh, the fact that you can buy the videos, but yet we're not allowed to see them on TV. Another thing, um, why did they, uh, you know, what kind of problems would we be faced with today if we were to try to get those back on television? In well, lieu uh, of the fact that what is showing on TV right now, I think is, is pretty crummy. I mean, we've got all this stuff, uh, everything right now is to do with sex and et cetera, and things that, in my opinion, do not uh, convey traditional family values. Right. I, I, I think the sex is bad, but that et cetera is even worse, you know. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Tom, leave it to you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, Marg, you know me. I, mean, yeah, I know. Uh, I love it. Well, anyway, why, you know, since we do, we, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the sitcoms are just nothing. Yeah. Now, we've got something like Amos and Andy that's what I think is really great entertainment. Well, I'll tell you, uh, on the one hand, the reason it's, it would be hard to bring back to television, one reason is that uh, so much emotion was invested in the controversy 40 years ago that, that, uh, that people who objected to the show then just just feel that, uh, you know, they spilled a, a, a blood, sweat, and tears to get the show off the air. and. Uh, and for that reason, if for, if for no other, they'd object to bringing it back. But I'll tell you something that you may not know, and that is if, if it ever does come back to television, it may be uh, African Americans in the TV industry who bring it back because the black uh, entertainment television uh, cable uh, station actually did a market survey among its viewers, and they claim to have found a large majority of their viewers wanting a comeback of Amos and Andy. I don't know if we're going to get that, but if we do, ironically, uh, it may be not white people, but black folk who bring it back. Mm -hmm. we'll, have, we'll have to wait and see. 
Well, you know, there's a big uh, interest right now even in the in, in the black culture. Uh, it, you know, I think Oprah Winfrey and, and Bill uh, Cosby, all of these people are collectors of uh, any of the signs or, or anything that, uh, you know, that was uh, prevalent during the before the civil rights movement. Well, anyway, Margaret, I thank you for calling us tonight. Thank I you. appreciate your sense uh -huh. of humor. Uh -huh. And as uh, Melvin says, I think that we live in a time, Melvin, that is radically different from uh, 40 years ago when the Amos and Andy brouhaha occurred. And I would not be surprised if not black entertainment television, possibly Nick at Night reruns, which are played late in the evening on cable, uh, cable networks around the country, USA television, that somehow this program doesn't surface. Uh, it's a program really of such quality. And the episode that you mentioned, the Christmas episode that you mentioned of Andy and the young girl, I mean, there's some, there are a lot of quality episodes that were produced in this series, and it's a shame that people don't have a chance to see them again. Well, that's true, but, you know, one other, uh, uh, one other stumbling block to bring it back, I think, would be the fact that there were only 78 episodes ever filmed, so it's, it's really kind of a collector's item in that sense. Do you know how many episodes there are of The Honeymooners? How many? 39. Is that right? Yes, sir. And it still plays to this day and, by the way, gets enormous numbers. Yeah. I'll tell you something. I've... Tell me after the break, okay? Yeah. i got a last one to do. Thank you, Melvin. We'll continue with Melvin Ely, the author of The Adventures of Amos and Andy, right after these messages. You can do it with true value. Hi, this is Willard Scott. Get ready for chilly days, cold nights, and winter heating bills with their Fall Shopper Circular. That's where you'll find the remarkable Comfort Plus Ceramic Furnace. It has six genuine ceramic heating elements for up to 5,200 BTUs per hour. And the economical Comfort Plus operates below the ignition point of tissue paper. Get it for just $79.88 at participating True Value hardware stores and home centers. Hey, I'm a nice person. I deserve it. Sears semi-annual fine jewelry sale, here I come. Gold, gemstones, pearls, watches, even diamonds are on sale now. 25 to 65% below comparable values elsewhere. And if I spend at least $100 on my Sears charge, I get 0% financing. I pay nothing till next year. Sears semi-annual fine jewelry sale is over on the 20th, so I better hurry. If you're a nice person and love a great sale, maybe you better hurry too. I'm with the cereal counter for new Honey Almond Delight, the cereal that's deliciously different. One, two, three, yeah, what are you counting? four, the sliced almonds. Sounds tasty. Crunchy nut clusters. Ooh, real tasty. And Honey Toasted Flakes, a new Honey Almond Delight. So tasty, I'll love it. You've got to try some. Mmm. Mmm. Uh, could I have a few boxes? How's three? How's 3,000? One, two, Can you count three, a little faster, please? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, three, six, eight, nine, twenty. New Honey Almond Delight cereal. It tastes deliciously different. Okay, identify this. Yep, it's a dying refrigerator. Gave its life for cold cuts. Fortunately, if you weren't emotionally attached, Sears Brand Central can replace it. Until Saturday, there's a Kenmore 18 cubic foot top mount for $419 even. Save 30 bucks. All frostless, too. Believe me, that's a real good price for a Kenmore. But it's just till Saturday at Sears Brand Central. The brand you want at the store you trust. Prices may vary in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. I'm Alex Trebek with another fun fact from the American Spectrum Encyclopedia. Today's answer is, this U.S. film actor played many cocky, aggressive, tough guy roles in classic gangster movies. I'll return with a question after this. Mommy, I need to do a book report on Alaska. Look in the American Spectrum Encyclopedia, dear. Mother, why was the Berlin Wall put up? It's in the American Spectrum Encyclopedia. Honey, let's start planning our cross-country vacation. Look in the American Spectrum Encyclopedia. The American Spectrum Encyclopedia. A colorful one-volume reference with over 17,000 entries and 3,800 illustrations. An encyclopedia for the entire family. And the only one endorsed by the American Booksellers Association. In bookstores everywhere. Although starring in such classic gangster movies as The Public Enemy and The Roaring Twenties, this actor won an Academy Award in 1942 for his portrayal of George M. Cohan in Yankee Doodle Dandy. Today's question is, who is James Cagney? That's today's fun fact. I'm Alex Trebek. Okay, you were about to say, my friend. Well, I was going to say that uh, in researching the book, of course, I went back and watched a lot of these TV episodes of Amos and Andy, and, uh, you know, I have to say uh, a, a lot of it is, is uh, well acted, a lot of it is funny, and uh, at the same time, more than a little of it uh, made me pretty uncomfortable. You know, I, I felt as though there really is an element there that's, that's antiquated and something that we've, we've gotten 
beyond, and I'm not quite sure. See, most of us haven't seen any of these shows for, for 30 years now. Right. I'm not sure that if, we're, if it were brought back uh, that it wouldn't rub salt in old wounds. So that's that's why I'm not a big advocate of bringing it back, but in, in the end, it's not going to be up to me anyway, so we'll, we'll uh, have to wait and see if popular demand brings it back. You know, I meant to get into this with you tonight, and the time is almost gone here. The fact that the problems that aim, and you write, you write about this at some length in your book, the problems that Amos and Andy faced in their lives were really trivial problems. They never faced any really great big problems. They were all easily solved problems, and the perception there was that the problems facing uh, black guys who emigrated north were really not that great. You, you know, you go into that in some detail, and I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to it tonight. Yeah, and the one problem they never faced in Amos and Andy was the problem of race. Yeah. Race never affected their, their yeah. lives. Yeah, they never were turned away from a lunch counter, never had to go to the back of a bus, never couldn't take a taxi, use a restroom, etc., etc. Absolutely. Et Quickly, what did the black audience in America think of Amos and Andy? It was always divided. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, you could uh, go out on a Harlem street and you'd find black Americans doing just what whites did. You'd find them gathering outside barber shops and radio stores on the sidewalk to listen to this, even in a driving rain. And at the same time, there were black spokespeople and just ordinary black folk who, almost from the beginning, protested against this show as either a slander on the race or a show that uh, depicted uh, only uh, poor, uneducated, southern-born blacks and uh, therefore gave people, white people the wrong idea. And the time is gone, Melvin, but I sure do thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. My pleasure, sir. Mr. Melvin Ely, the author of The Adventures of Amos and Andy. I'm Tom Snyder, and this is the Wednesday Night Radio Show out of ABC in Los Angeles. Thanks for listening, everybody.